Okay, good evening everybody. Uh, welcome to the public lecture as part of our conference of ICEF at the Laboratory of Financial Economics. We have invited Heracles Polymachakis, Polymachakis is the right to say. Um, and unfortunately he got sick in, in the last moment. Uh, we just heard about it yesterday. And Dimitrios uh, was so nice to jump in, and yeah, so he basically prepared a lecture from scratch in one day. And we very much admire him, and uh, we are very thankful to Dimitrios uh, to deliver this lecture today uh, with the title Macro Modeling, uh, Money and Default. Dimitrios. Bolsoi spasiba, zavase pris glasenia. That's my Russian knowledge. The rest of my knowledge of the Russian language starts from Nazdarovia. So, let me switch then to English. Thank you very much for inviting me. Uh, I'm honored to be once again uh, to the ISEF and to HSC. Unfortunately, you expected somebody else to be around. Uh, however, you have to be satisfied now with a poor substitute of Heracles. Anyway, I would like to start this presentation uh, with the second uh, joke I wanted to say about Sudipto Bhattacharya, who has given this public lecture. I remember when I started being involved uh, in this uh, long-run uh, project, uh, something about uh, 12 years ago, uh, about uh, building uh, analytical models of financial fragility and financial stability, uh, with the usual suspect, Charles Goodhart, uh, and of course, since I was a student of Martin Schubik, in spirit, Martin Schubik and John Janakopoulos were present in my work, uh, I had just met Sudipto Bhattacharya. And when I described about my aspirations and my intellectual ambitions, Sudipto Bhattacharya told me a story. He said, when I was a student at MIT, uh, I was taking a course uh, with Paul Samuelson, and I had some disagreements and some questions with his lecture. And of course, it was the king at the time, Paul Samuelson, after I asked my first question, then I stopped. Uh, at the end of the class, Paul uh, approached me. He said, young man, you're right. I had made a mistake. Never forget, when you go for the king, shoot the king. So that's exactly what he told me in 1998 when we had started embarking in this uh, work. So what I'll try to do I'll try basically to talk about uh, the importance of default and money and liquidity in macroeconomics. And in fact, you see that uh, even in today's presentations, the importance of monetary policy and liquidity and how it affects and is affected by financial fragility and financial instability. This is joint work uh, with the usual suspect, Charles Goodhart, my long-term collaborator, and if you will, my third supervisor, Martin Subic, and myself. And basically, uh, it was a piece that we, uh, we tried to write uh, to emphasize what Charles Goodhart might say as default is to macroeconomics, what sin is to theology. Regrettable, but central and essential. So this whole talk will gravitate around this uh, theme. I'll try first to talk about uh, the inadequacy and the inefficiencies of mainstream macroeconomics nowadays. Uh, then I'll try to allude and give you a description about how to incorporate default to macroeconomics, something which is entirely absent nowadays. And we saw after the international financial crisis how important and how crucial is this inadequacy of modern macroeconomic analysis. Then I'll try to describe the implications of introducing and embedding default into formal macroeconomic modeling. In other words, I'll try to talk about the cost of default, the need to have an integral monetary sector in macroeconomic modeling. It is something that everybody took for given and for granted 20 years ago, when I was an undergraduate in the, late 90, in the late 80s, I wish it was in the late 90s, when I was an undergraduate in the late 80s, monetary theory and the monetary sector was present in any conceivable model. 
Nowadays, this trend has been reversed, and once again, and once again after the crisis, we start realizing how important it is to have money in macroeconomic models. As I usually argue, if you have non-monetary models of monetary policy, in effect, it's like trying to perform an operation without the patient being present on the operating table. And unfortunately, that's exactly what is happening in modern monetary, uh, monetary uh, policy analysis. And in fact, it's remarkable, I don't know any other scientific exercise or intellectual domain that such a thing happens. Then we'll talk about the functions of liquidity. I'll try to talk about the crucial, if you will, the crux of the debate in modern macroeconomics, the issue of monetary policy neutrality or non-neutrality for that matter. In the policy circles, if you go to any central bank, I think there is no debate about it. But believe it or not, in academia, still a debate that was initiated, I think, in the 70s, if I'm, uh, uh, in fact, even before that, by Milton Friedman, still it's a debate that has not been resolved. Uh, and I'll take my pick and I'll offer you my opinion and uh, our position on this issue. And finally, I'll try to talk about how micro-founded macroeconomics and finance could possibly look like if such a marriage is possible. Then I'll talk about modeling banks and about examples of what one should avoid doing and the last question before, I'm, before I finish my criticism is whether uh, a complex process-oriented institutional system uh, could ever be adequately captured by general equilibrium analysis. Uh, the ones who know my work, uh, you know that my intellectual position uh, for general equilibrium and therefore I'll try to address whether general equilibrium can serve the purpose of a bulwark to uh, integrate, if you will, uh, micro and finance in a macroeconomic uh, framework. Of course, uh, the second part of uh, this talk will be focused where we can and where we should go from an intellectual point of view uh, in uh, macro and finance. And then I'll try to emphasize uh, the interrelations between liquidity and default, because our position is, and if you will, our distinction with many of uh, our colleagues is you cannot study one without the other. You cannot study liquidity without default or default without liquidity. Liquidity affects and is affected by default, and likewise default affects and is affected by liquidity. Or if you will, to use an analogy, default and liquidity are the two sides of the same coin. So analysis that focuses in one without the other, to some extent, is uh, in one-handed and in one-track-minded analysis. And then I'll try to offer a take in an effort we have made with some other colleagues of ours, namely uh, Anil Kashyap, Alex Vardulakis, uh, myself and Charles Goodhart, how to incorporate financial regulation uh, in a general equilibrium framework whereby we'll discuss the externalities present uh, in our modeling approach, uh, the tools, the channels of financial regulation. We will emphasize the welfare, and throughout my talk, I would like to be, uh, to be a little bit, uh, if you will, uh, very firm about that. I don't want to emphasize only price effects and only uh, nominal value changes, but also welfare effects, because we believe that our analysis should be a combined analysis of both uh, prices and quantities. And if you do, if you focus both on prices as well as quantities, then you cannot escape studying welfare. And basically, this is the door that one can integrate and study and determine whether or not the real and the financial sector interact. Because as I said before, one has to show whether the real and the financial sector interacts rather than assume the interaction or the lack of it. Uh, so let me start talking a little bit about why mainstream uh, macroeconomic modeling is insufficient. Uh, 
The key and that basically the criticism I will present today goes back to the work of Martin Schubig in the framework, in a game theoretic framework of introducing a monetary sector into closed economic models. Basically, it involves no process. Uh, basically, the invisible hand is the dux ac machina that resolves, clears the market and balances uh, the equilibrium system. And institutions are either non-existent or taken as given. So there is no proper modeling of the institutions of money, banks, and so on and so forth. Moreover, it is a static apart from some productivity gains that introduced as, if you will, error terms uh, in most of these models and cannot be defined out of equilibrium. In other words, uh, in other words the standard macroeconomic model is a non-process, ahistorical, a-institutional, if not pre-institutional model of analysis. And uh, basically this has as a consequence, the most important thing is to assume away, in our opinion, default. And default, as now we know very well, was, is a key and a present characteristic of modern financial economics and of modern capital markets, as we all saw in the international financial crisis. And how we do this, basically, is the usual convenient trick is basically using the transversality conditions, we use the transversality conditions, which basically is also an internally inconsistent kind of an assumption. I cannot talk or try to talk about default and at the same time to introduce transversality conditions, even though we think that the transversality conditions is not only, they don't only point towards the direction of precluding default, but also they have consequences about the optimality uh, of uh, steady state uh, equilibrium and equilibrium paths. Moreover, the standard models, for the most part, there are few notable exceptions, they have complete financial markets and no transaction costs, no transaction costs are present. And this, I don't have to argue that transaction costs and incomplete missing financial markets are an integral part of our, uh, of our economic reality. Why? Because if markets were complete, then we wouldn't have any financial innovation or security design. The very fact that the markets are incomplete and they are unhedged aggregate as well as individual risk necessitates, makes obvious the necessity to introduce uh, a general equilibrium with complete asset analysis. Moreover, the standard Walras, Aro de Bre, uh, model, since it's not defined out of equilibrium and process is not present in the model, makes no room to introduce properly a monetary sector. And I'll talk a little bit more about it later. Last but not least, the standard macroeconomic model has no room for institutions. It's a pre-institutional or a-institutional kind of way of analysis. In particular, for financial stability analysis, there are no financial intermediaries. Or the entire commercial banking sector has been, and the entire transmissions mechanism has been lumped with this God-given tailor function. Nobody knows where does this function come from, and nobody knows how this function is derived. It is assumed. And when I say assume, I'm talking now here as a mathematical economist, whereby the assumption and the conclusion has distance epsilon, as epsilon goes to zero. Uh, moreover, we cannot have uh, such uh, intermediate frictions without being uh, able to model default. There are many uh, seminal and adjunct models, uh, such as the Kiyotaki Moore and the Bernanke Gertler Gilchrist Mood, uh, that require default in the unexplored background. And in fact, the new trend nowadays is, since everybody has realized that default is not an intellectual curiosity but an economic reality, they allow in the definition of a model the possibility of default, but there is no default in equilibrium. It's an out of equilibrium phenomenon. So our position is that default not only has to be defined in and out of equilibrium, but also default is compatible with the orderly functioning of the modern market system. Why default is not modeled? We believe that default basically is not modeled because it's a discontinuous variable. Inflation and the main macroeconomic variables, they're 
central moments of the, they, they, they try to describe and analyze central moments of the distributions. Unlike default, that basically necessitates us to try to search what is happening at the tails of the distribution. So this discontinuity is something that basically has uh, make burden, if you will, the introduction of default, the formal introduction of default in our macroeconomic modeling. Now, if you go back, back in the 70s, the first one, at least to the best of my knowledge, that tried to resolve this issue in a coherent way was in the context of strategic market game, it was Martin Schubig and Chuck Wilson. Uh, and basically, uh, they turned the problem around as the expectation of repayment. So in other words, they endogenized Schubig and Wilson in 1975, uh, default as being endogenous probabilities of default or expected rates of repayment. And subsequently, this sort of analysis has been taken over by uh, Hart and Moore and uh, various other authors. But for historical accuracy, it was uh, Sapley and Schubig and uh, Schubig and Wilson that they were the first ones that in a closed model introduced continuous default. The main problem that as long as you go that uh, route and you introduce the endogenous default is the dimensionality of the model becomes much, much greater. Agents differ in their risk aversion, so agents become different, they are heterogeneous, so you depart from the convenient and user-friendly assumption of the representative uh, agent uh, unreal uh, assumption, so some will default and uh, where others will not. Uh, uh, will not. The representative agent approach basically is the only exception that should not admit default considerations because heterogeneity and default are go hand in hand. Because the heterogeneity and default is what introduces distributional uh, misallocations and differentiations across uh, agents within the same period and within and uh, transfers from one state of nature to the other. Also, more sectors at the minimum bank should also be included. In the strategic market games approach that in effect underlines our modeling approach, basic process is explicit. As Martin Subic would argue, any model that has institutions and process could be played as a playable game in a classroom. So in other words, if you properly define both in equilibrium and out of equilibrium, you can take any of these models, have it a playable game, which you can play among uh, uh, within a classroom. Now, and that's basically something uh, that's something that one has to bear in mind how complicated things can be, even in the absence, if you start introducing dynamics and process, even in the absence of banks or non-bank financial institutions. You need credit evaluation. If you start introducing the institution of credit and money, you need uh, stocks, commodity and goods markets. You need clearing houses, netting or super netting, a payment and transfer systems. You need also ways to resolve the cases where people do not honor and they abrogate their contractual obligations. So very quickly, a model becomes increasingly complex. However, however, if one takes the time and pays the price of complicating the model then and introducing default uh, in a coherent way in a model, then many implications naturally emerge. What are the costs, uh, what are the implications of taking default uh, seriously? The first implication is that we have various welfare costs of default. First, you have the collateral loss or margins. Collateral in non-default models cannot be treated properly. You have the non-pecuniary reputation costs that, often, that open the door for many moral hazard and contract theoretic problems. You also have pecuniary costs that uh, may be implemented by different bankruptcy laws as garnishing endowments, confiscating houses, and so on and so forth. And finally, it opens the door for a serious and rigorous investigation of the interaction of law and finance. In other words, how the bankruptcy code and how default penalties should be implemented and legislated. So this is the first main implication if you start talking about default uh, seriously. Secondly, as I said in the introduction, when you introduce default, then immediately the minimal institution of a monetary sector 
creeps in into your modeling uh, framework. So you need either cash or liquidity in advance, and as Nobu and John Moore would say, evil is the root of all money. And in a functioning state with a structure of law, fiat money always dominates commodity money. And this is not an innocuous result, the fact that fiat money dominates commodity money. Because most of the hopefully extant but rapidly re-emerging all macroeconomic literature, people had decided to introduce a monetary sector by introducing money in the utility function. In other words, by introducing commodity money. But in well-functioning states, nowadays we don't have commodity money. In other words, we cannot simulate fiat money with commodities that give us utilities, since euros or pounds or rubles do not give in and of themselves utility, except if you're a banker and you want to count how many zeros your checking account has, and that gives you some sort of satisfaction. But normally, fiat money should be in the model, but should not be in the utility function. People do not eat coins and uh, notes. Third implication will be the functions of liquidity. In a walrus arrow de bre kind of world, one has to observe that nobody is liquidity constrained. In our framework, and I'm referring now to the framework that Charles Goodhart, Tom Suniran, and myself have developed, and it used to be the Goodhart Suniran Tsomokos model, then it was the Goodhart et al. model, and nowadays even myself, I refer to it as the Goodhart model. That's what happens if your name starts with a T. Uh, in a Goodhart type of model, Everyone is liquidity constrained at least up to a point. And that basically opens the door of the interaction between the real and the financial sector. And that basically brings us to the most important position that we are taking in our world, that money is non-neutral. In other words, the availability of money as a means of exchange and a store of value affects liquidity constraints, probabilities of default, and credit risk premia. In other words, in other words, then the transactions demand for cash is endogenously derived in our world and therefore default and liquidity premia have real effects. Or if you, will, if, uh, you will, uh, if you would like to see this issue from a different point of view, the very introduction of money introduces a wedge, a transaction cost between buying and selling goods. When you sell a good, so to speak, I sell one potato, I get the price of the potato. But when I buy, if there is a nominal sector and I borrow money, then, and the interest rates are positive, then there is a wedge because you also have to pay back the interest rate. Therefore, when you change interest rates, you change marginal utilities and therefore you have non-neutral effects. So, in other words, if one realizes these implications if the, these implications of default, then you have to reintegrate financial stability, uh, whose main characteristic is default, and financial regulation with monetary policy. And this is not, and that I have to emphasize, and in fact, uh, it's a pleasure to have students of yours as colleagues, being in the audience, as the case of Udara, that sometimes express more accurately what you have in mind. That's a pleasure for any supervisor when, in fact, this morning emphasized once again and reminded me that the credit channel is a different channel than you have having a default channel. When you have credit constraints, you have intertemporal distributional effects. The intertemporal marginal rate of substitution is altered, whereas if you have default, you have intra-period or across-stage distributional effects. And that basically begs the question that you need heterogeneity of agents. So, default and homogeneities of agents do not go together. You need heterogeneous agents in order to be able to understand the distributional effects and the welfare costs that default introduces into your modeling. Now, all of these criticism or suggestions are quite nice. However, can such a complex system ever be adequately captured in a GE model? In fact, we all know in fact, we all know that everything is possible in a general equilibrium model. In fact, things are even more uh, pessimistic. We also know the De Bremen tel Sonnenschein theorem that give us any result, any demand function, any aggregate demand function, and a good general equilibrium theorist can produce a model that replicates this demand function. In other words, the model can do everything. And 
equivalently does nothing. Uh, well, we don't agree with this position, obviously, and I believe uh, that a large number of degrees of freedom arise once money and default are introduced, and thereby, uh, and thereby one has to re recognize that this framework tries to capture uh, the real and the financial system that are loosely coupled, uh, with, whereas the financial system serves the purpose of a neural network of the economy and the interactions become unsustainable, that leads to default. In other words, in a nutshell, we believe that we have to model a complex world, we have to see all the channels and all the interactions and the feedback mechanism that exists in the economy and then one can select the important ones. Not assume away channels in order to have cleaner, if you will, uh, and surprising results. I want to see first, and this is for, at least for us, this is the vindication of general equilibrium analysis, is the ability to observe all the, uh, all the channels contemporaneously, and then to decide and take a view which ones you think they are important. And if one wants to seriously talk about welfare, it has to admit that welfare affects and is affected by, by not only first order effects and second order effects. In other words, as Jean-Claude Trichet used to say, uh, the world is non-linear. So by having highly linearized models, one can go that far. So the non-linear effects sometimes, or the second order effects, are more important than the first order effects. And that's exactly what one can achieve with a general equilibrium framework with money and default. How to model all of those things? Basically, that was the project. That's a project that exists and uh, has started a long time ago by many uh, uh, distinct, uh, distinguished economists uh, with uh, the French school of uh, uh, temporary uh, general equilibrium, with Martin Schubing, who coined the word uh, mathematical institutional economics. And basically, this way, you have a framework which, if you appropriately parameterize it with a question at hand, you can uh, do robust checks, you can do robust checks, and you can build a political economy that is flexible enough and yet also is analytically tractable. Where do we go from there? The development of economics basically has a long way to go. That's why we exist. And there is no generally accepted theory of dynamics. Yet, macroeconomics without dynamics, it is a mute point and is of not of any particular use. And our aim is not to revert to a narrative, because after the crisis, basically, many people who are more qualitative in their thinking, they use the international crisis, the international financial crisis, to ditch any mathematical modeling or any analytical attempt to model uh, human interactions. And on that, on that ground, uh, I may say that I am on the corner of the dynamic stochastic general equilibrium analysis that has been, to some extent, unfairly blamed for many failures of predicting the issues that we may or may not disagree are at a different level, but not on the necessity to use general equilibrium analysis as uh, distinguished colleagues in uh, the DSG uh, literature do. So, the flexible but logically consistent process-oriented models that Martin Schubig first uh, has introduced uh, and uh, together with Lloyd Shapley uh, translate with care into stochastic process models incorporating default and boundary constraints in a natural way. In a special simple examples, it is also possible to obtain interior equilibria and to have a very robust set of intuitions. In more complicated ways, one parameterizes, calibrates, and conducts his or her analysis. Now, let me be a little bit more specific how liquidity and default interact and why it is from a practical point of view important to have the two institutions and the institution of liquidity as well as endogenous default present in a model. First of all, liquidity, uh, default as a general equilibrium phenomenon and compatible with the, orderly, with the orderly function of the markets and in that respect we don't try to replicate the work of Diamond and Divic, we want to go 
in, to study default in the continuum as an everyday phenomenon, as an equilibrium phenomenon, and therefore to open the door for policy intervention to deal with default. So default as an equilibrium, default as an equilibrium phenomenon plus incomplete markets and liquidity constitute financial stability. Our view, our view is that default without incomplete markets, as I've already argued, is a mute point in a way that if markets were complete, all the risks can be insured and therefore default never occurs. But the key thing of combining default, missing financial markets and liquidity is that re regulation, or if you will more abstractly, policy intervention affects default and insurance and the optimal risk sharing. And financial trade, financial volumes due to the constraint in efficiency. In other words, in our world, in our framework, obviously, since we have introduced frictions, we don't get efficiency. The first welfare theorem does not obtain. But this is not the whole story. In our framework, basically abides with the famous Janakopoulos Polemarchakis uh, theorem that equilibria are constrained inefficient. In other words, not only they are inefficient, in other words, we don't go to the second best, we, we don't go to the first best, we don't even go to the second best, we are going to the third best. So, with retaining, with retaining the financial frictions, policy via transfers, via taxes, via capital requirements, liquidity requirements, so on and so forth, and as we will see in 10 minutes, as we will see in 10 minutes, affects welfare. And that's, I think, the crux of our modeling, and if you will, our stark distinction with the standard Woodford BGG approach. We don't have just inefficient equilibria. We have constrained inefficient equilibria. And real and nominal sectors interact, affect, and they're affected by each other. They are dialectically connected, and therefore, policy intervention may induce welfare improvements. Basically, the two, the key thing about default, that's the only maths I will use today for the ones who you know me, you should already start congratulating me silently that I have not used a single uh, subscript of AppleScript so far. Uh, basically, the two options of default that we have is one, the continuous default, whereby basically you are allowed in your past contractual obligations to repay up to the full amount. So you choose, if you have contracted a loan, your repayment rate VS as a choice variable. It can be anything from zero up to one. And uh, how do you uh, choose this? By having a private monetary endowment or some liquidity injection or by rolling over your debt. And that gives you basically the main, the main consideration of how to weigh the marginal benefit of default versus the marginal cost. Because since I have an endogenous choice variable, an endogenous choice variable that is the repayment rate, then basically agents weigh the benefits, the pros and the cons of default. Now, what are the negatives of default is the default penalties. Because in order to close the system, since I allow now for V to be equal to zero, if there is no cost associated with default, nobody would ever repay anything. If, on the other hand, we're in Saudi Arabia, when you default, they cut your hands, your head, and uh, various other parts of your uh, uh, body, then nobody would ever dare to default because you have the minus infinity payoff. And there you are back to the standard Walrasian Aro de Bre world. So, if you have an, inter an intermediate default penalty, then you weigh the cost of default with the marginal utility with the marginal utility of the consumption that you will acquire by defaulting, say, uh, one euro, which will be one over the price times the interest payments that you save if you have borrowed money times the marginal utility. In other words, a higher short-term rate increases the cost of liquidity to serve past loans and therefore induces agents to default more and more and more. And this is the key, if you will, equilibrium condition that determines endogenously and makes default compatible with equilibrium. That's why you have different default uh, bankruptcy codes across different countries because they associate different marginal costs with respect to the marginal benefits of default. The second way to default is if good one is durable and uh, the loan uh, 
that you contract with a bank is collateralized. So basically, I open the door to model mortgages and securitization, mortgage-backed securities, and uh, the like. Then when the value of the collateral at equilibrium is less than the face value of debt, then agents default completely. So in other words, the nominal obligations are fixed, whereas uh, the value of the collateral is endogenously fixed. So when the value of the collateral falls below the nominal value of your contractual obligations, then you default. And the higher and the implication and the implication of this kind of observation is that the higher the cost of liquidity, the lower the prices. And this is the standard quantity theory of money argument, and that may generate that may generate uh, debt deflation. And basically, in the next question, and this is a question that, as I have already alluded, uh, as I have already alluded, Dubai, Janakopoulos, and Subic, Subic, and Wilson have resolved. What is the optimal? What is the optimal default penalty? Because one may naturally think that the plus infinity, very harsh default penalty that precludes default altogether is the optimal default penalty. Or likewise, one should say, why should we have very high default penalties? And Subic and Wilson with and Dubai and Janakopoulos showed the following thing. Assume in a very simple world that they have two agents. And this is the arrow de Bre efficiency frontier. So basically, these are the allocations that provide you the first best solution. Now, since in our complicated model we have all these frictions, the possibility of default, positive interest rates and the like, that means that equilibria will not be efficient. That's simple. Now, the key argument here is that the optimal default penalty is neither zero, so not you burn the house and no questions are asked, nor the Saudi Arabian bankruptcy code where they chop your fingers. So the optimal default penalty is an intermediate default penalty. Why? Assume without, for the sake of the example, that there are 100 different uh, future scenarios uh, in the future. And in the 99 scenarios, everybody will uh, abide uh, to his contractual or her contractual obligations. And only in one of the 100 scenarios, due to an exogenous shock, people will default. So if, the, if people are risk averse, and if the default penalty is very high, then that will imply that nobody will take any risk taking. So excessively harsh default penalties kill risk taking behavior. Therefore, the optimal default penalty is somewhere in the middle. And that's the famous uh, intuition that uh, Chuck Wilson and Martin Schubing uh, had. The second observation is basically to realize that contractionary monetary policy, and then I'm going back to the integration, if you will, of monetary and financial stability analysis, is that monetary policy can result in deflationary uh, pressures. And this is an observation that we are well aware since the 30s by the Irving Fisher argument of the debt deflation. And one you can see from stylized facts uh, these are American data that there is not a one to one mapping from contractionary policy to default. Decreasing monetary supply results after a threshold point to default on only after a point. And therefore, the externality comes from the inefficient reallocation of the foreclosed collateral due to agent heterogeneity. And once again, in this stylized fact, one realizes the importance of heterogeneity. Please observe that this sort, of an obje this sort of an externality cannot arise in homogeneous models. In highly aggregated models, and in other words, in the representative agent fiction, this kind of externality cannot arise. So after I hope I have convinced you that we need liquidity and default in formal macroeconom macroeconomic modeling, then I will present our take, our straw man, because usually... I'm going back to the late Sudipto, when you go for the king, shoot the king, make an alternative proposal, not only your criticism, let the strong man exist and let the others improve it or, even better, replace it. So now I will talk, I will sketch the argument that has been produced uh, with Anil Kashyap, uh, Charles Goodhart and Alex Vardulakis. Charles is in the Financial Markets Group, Anil is in Chicago, Alex is in the ECB and the Banque de France. And they're 
two, uh, there two papers from where I will try uh, to draw material. Now, our model ingredients, and what we are trying to do here, we have the simplest, the meekier than mouse model, if you will, the meekier than mouse model, if you will, that I have two goods. I have potatoes, which is a perishable good, it's a consumption good, and I have a durable. So already, I we dis distinguish ourselves from the st standard walrus at the walrus arrow of the bread tradition that all the goods are perishable. We have one security, that's a mortgage-backed security, so that to allow, to allow for uh, securitization, uh, we have a finite horizon, so I insist to produce the meekier than mouse model uh, with only two periods, so simple stuff, and three types of households or of investors. I have a rich which is endowed with a lot of houses in both periods in all states of nature, and I have two poor uh, households that they are uh, the working class, that they are endowed only with potatoes, and I have the old households that they are present in both uh, periods, and the first time home buyers that they are present only in the second period. So in other words, I try to take a snapshot of what we have in mind of an overlapping generations model. And we have two types of financial institutions. One is the standard commercial banking sector, where it has high risk aversion and a big and a robust balance sheet. And on the other hand, I have the non-bank or the shadow banking system, where I have low risk aversion and this sector is involved in regulatory arbitrage. And finally, I have a central bank and a regulator that make short-term loans to the bank B. What is the market structure of my model? So we have the borrowers, that they are the farmers, if you will, the young and the old, and you have the rich, uh, the rich uh, rentiers that possess a lot of, of the durable good. Then we have the housing and the goods markets where, um, uh, where the lenders and the borrowers interact and how they interact, uh, the borrowers buy houses and the lenders buy goods from uh, the farmers. Now, since I have money in the model and liquidity, how does the exchange take place? It is intermediated with money. So one exchanges money for houses and money for goods. Then I have the commercial banking sector and the central bank, and the commercial banking sector draws funds from the central bank and in turn extends short-term loans both to the borrowers and to the lenders. So imagine a standard, simple, if you wish, stylized transmission mechanism in the model. Moreover, the banks, they can issue mortgages to the borrowers that want to acquire houses. And now, the interesting part of the model, and this is the addition, if you will, the extension over the standard Goodhart model, is that we introduce a shadow bank that securitizes the mortgages of, that the commercial bank offers to the borrowers. So basically, we try to incorporate, if you will, the uh, cardinal sin or the origination cause, the originating cause of most of financial crisis, namely the real estate market. And the shadow banking system borrows from the commercial bank using collateralized repo loans. And finally, since we're interested in regulation, we have the regulator that interacts, we have the regulator that interacts with imposing regulations, either capital regulations or liquidity regulations to the commercial banks, uh, they are able to impose loan-to-value regulations to the borrowers and uh, they are allowed to introduce haircuts and margin requirements to the shadow banks. Now, the externalities. So basically that's the entire model. That's the entire model and how we define equilibrium. All of these agents and the, three, uh, the two borrowers and the lenders, as well as the commercial banking uh, system and the shadow banking system they are endowed with their own objective functions. They maximize their profits and their utilities uh, correspondingly. Markets clear, all agents are rational and an equilibrium is achieved. What are the externalities of this model? The externalities and the tools that we have in our position are as follows. The intermediaries 
What is the role of the intermediaries? They improve intertemporal smoothing and smoothing across states of nature at the cost of amplifying shocks because they are leveraged. So that's the good thing for the existence of the intermediaries because the natural question that referees ask, not policy makers, why do you need intermediaries if you don't do out of the breath? Well, if you have incomplete markets and the possibility of default, intermediaries smooth consumption across time and across states of nature. What is the negative? Regulations dump amplifications because the over leverage and the leverage cycle that may increase the volatility of uh, equilibrium allocations and uh, prices can be dumped by regulations. However, since there are extra constraints in the equilibrium manifold, they restrict smoothing and thereby we have knock-on effects for uh, house price collapses and subsequent repo defaults because both the mortgages as well as the repo uh, borrowing from uh, the shadow banking system from the commercial banks, they are defaultable. And therefore, we have the three mechanisms that are present in the dissemination and the exacerbation of a financial crisis, which is the fire sales of mortgage-backed securities by banks, deposit defaults, in other words, increased probabilities of default of commercial banks to the depositors, and a potential margin spiral. And the, here I give you a stylized, a stylized uh, diagram uh, of how this margin spiral uh, can uh, reinforce each other. You may have, due to an exogenous shock, an equilibrium house price uh, reduction that this may cause household defaults on mortgages and if household uh, default on mortgages increases that will decrease the mortgage-backed security uh, prices and thereby will entice or induce the shadow banking system to default. If the shadow banking system defaults, then the commercial banking, they have to fire sale mortgage, uh, they have to be involved in fire sales in order uh, to, and then they depress mortgage-backed security prices even further. Now, by depressing mortgage-backed security prices even further, then we have the classical, uh, we close the circle by having a reduction of uh, the bank's commercial banking sector's capital that will precipitate in a credit crunch. And that, the credit crunch, will further decrease uh, housing prices and so on and so forth, and then you can go to a death spiral. So this is the main mechanism that is present in our model. It's not assumed. It is an equilibrium outcome. That's very important. And we investigate five potential regulatory tools to correct for this externality. Either loan-to-value ratios or margin requirement, capital requirements, liquidity requirements, and dynamic provisioning. Dynamic provisioning basically is the only state contingent regulatory tool where basically you necessitate, you oblige banks to build up their buffer, their capital buffer in the good times, so that to have some defensive mechanism in the rainy day. It is akin to what the Spanish banks were doing uh, in the early 2000s. Apparently, with what we read in the newspapers, this policy didn't work for Spain. Nevertheless, we investigate this regulatory intervention as well. The three channels of financial regulation are the exante tools, that basically how they operate. All the exante tools discourage Indonesian lending to make the bus less extreme. Margin requirements on repos, loan-to-value requirements on mortgages, potential capital and liquidity requirements on banks. These are the exante tools. Second, we can shore up uh, the banks in the event of a bust. How we can shore up banks in the event of a bust? First, by insisting on capital requirements, of having higher capital requirements, and second, by uh, introducing liquidity requirements. However, higher liquidity requirements, they have a negative externality of making fire sales worse. Finally, the last channel of financial regulation will be to lean against the boom, to lean against the wind, and we do this with dynamic provisioning on real estate-related uh, credit. And it is very hard to lean against the, boot, uh, the boom or to have counter-cyclical buffers using capital or loan-to-value or margin requirements. In particular, loan-to-value requirements, they, also, they are also politically unappetizing because during the boom to increase uh, uh, loan-to-value requirements it has always uh, very negative political effects.
So basically, these are our channels. And then the next step of our analysis is to start investigating in a parameterized, in a calibrated world, the five, the five different tools. And these are the results that we get. The results that we get, basically, the counter-cyclical capital requirements, the objective is to lessen the spillover of the repo default of the shadow banking to the commercial banking sector and to lean against greater risk by raising the cost of credit. What we find, as you will realize here, and the capital requirements in the first period uh, and the capital requirements uh, in the bad state of the second period, that they reduce uh, mortgage issuance, raise securitization, and raise the mortgage rate. Households consume less housing services, and banks face uh, le less risk. And that will have, as a, de as a result, also to have lower defaults. If I have stricter haircuts, and stricter haircuts basically are modeled as margin requirements, the policy motivation will be to complement cyclical capital requirements and to lean against the built-up of risk in funding contracts, futures, and derivatives. What do we find? We find that we reduce the repo borrowing, uh, raise the cost of mortgages, total mortgages are higher, and reduces the size of repo default and uh, the size of mortgage repayment. The third tool is the loan-to-value, the political unappetizing loan-to-value regulation that basically caps uh, reduced borrower and lender exposure to asset prices declines uh, and also reduce borrower defaults and lean against price appreciation. We find that indeed uh, they have less fire sales and shadow bank instability and they are problematic as a preemptive tool due to the inflated housing values. Finally, the last, um, the last two tools are the liquidity coverage ratio that is imposed uh, in period one in the present to the commercial banking sector but basically protects the bank against wholesale funding shocks and re uh, the question is whether it reduces the incentives of banks to sell their mortgage-backed securities and head off the fire sale. What we find with uh, the provision, the dynamic provisioning, which is the last column, we find that indeed it's a good preemptive tool that banks reduce their mortgage issuance uh, quite precipitously, then uh, uh, it raises the mortgage rate and uh, banks are involved in more uh, short-term lending. After this kind of analysis, we went and we asked uh, different questions. Because you realize here, we know now the channels, but you realize that none of these policies gives you a welfare improvement. In other words, since I have more than one externality in my model, what happens really, what happens really on the one hand, with loan to values, I can improve and support the balance sheets and the profitability of the banks, but I, adverse, uh, I affect adversely the welfare of uh, the real sector. Uh, likewise, with dynamic provisioning, I can... Uh, take care of my real sector, yet I adverse negatively and the banks and the rich household owner. So the next question, and that basically is the answer, is a manifestation of the Jonakopoulos polemarchakis theorem that our equilibrium does not even arrive at the second best. It's constrained inefficient. And what we try to do, we try now to combine regulations and to see which pair of regulations may induce a welfare improvement for all agents involved. Not easy. We tried to do it analytically. We failed miserably. We had an intuition uh, and then uh, by trial and error and with the intuition we had from the model we managed to find the solution. And the mistake we were making because the debate was that liquidity requirements was something that could welfare improve uh, everybody involved, it was the wrong assumption because liquidity requirements worsen the fire sales mechanism in the bad state of nature and it turns out that the optimal combination, the optimal combination of regulatory packages is to have 
counter-cyclical buffers in the market, therefore both of them have to be regulated. And you have capital requirements for the commercial banking sector and margin requirements for the shadow banking sector. And this basically shows the power of having heterogeneous models. Had we not incorporated the way we did the shadow banking system, we would have not seen how important it is to regulate both parts of market participants and the commercial banks and the shadow banks. So that was basically, basically our uh, experiment that justifies, uh, justifies policy intervention, justifies counter-cyclical uh, buffers and regulation of uh, the leverage cycle that is caused by the, the, uh, the risk-loving shadow banking sector. So that's basically our preliminary, so to speak, our first pass uh, on regulation and introdu introducing both liquidity uh, constraints and default in equilibrium, both collateral default and continuous default, and how far we went, it is shown basically by this experiment. And let me offer now some concluding remarks uh, and basically what we have argued, what I've tried to argue over the last hour is that modeling the frictions matters and there is a very high payoff to be analytically precise and accurate how you violate the Modigliani-Miller. Because obviously we have violated the Modigliani-Miller from the banking point of view. Our analysis shows that focusing on the channels through which the five regulatories operate is probably more important than the institutions or markets to which they are applied. So always the externality is the important thing rather than to go and focus on the objective function of the institution where regulation is being implemented. Third conclusion is the need to contemporaneously study financial and monetary policy analysis together. In other words, conventional monetary policy basically as uh, it was mentioned in the previous session, focuses on the short end of the yield curve while regulatory policy intervenes at a different stage of the transmission mechanism in the medium uh, end of the yield curve. And the overall, if you will, theoretical conclusion is basically the re-emergence of the Timbergen rule. The very same way that in policy, as many policy tools, as, more, as many policy objectives you have, so many policy tools you need, and in financial stability, as many externalities are present in your argument, in your model, so many regulatory or intervention tools you need in order to be able to correct and control for them. So the timber rules, as many objectives, so many tools, is re-emerging uh, in a very uh, solid and robust way here and basically gives an implicit answer to whether one should use the interest rates and monetary policy to kill both birds and monetary policy stability and price stability and finance stability. This is not the case. You need both regulation and monetary policy to be conducted in conjunction in order to achieve the optimal result for the welfare and the financial stability of the economy. Thank you. Okay, okay I'll, I'll be the last shy one. First of all, without question, making two statements. So, I think I think you were unfair. Taylor rules, you can get them as optimal policies. Woodford does it, has done it, in models in which you have a role for money, cash in advance. But Woodford has no money like Cash in advance constraint. Woodford, you can get from. Uh, from optimizing the welfare, of the representative visions, you, you can get a, a Taylor rule for policy as optimal. Okay, so some people that is serious, do serious. And another point in which I think you were not totally fair, even the I hate that, but the representation with money in the utility function, with a uh, Rottenberg result, there are, whenever you have homogeneous um, preferences, and once again, cash in advance constraint. There is an isomorphism between sticking it in the right way, monitoring the utility function, and using the cash in advance constraint. Footnotes. Now, but this type of assumption that you don't like, are they less bad than continuous default? That's the question. 
el es más simpático de mi sound. Pero no tengo una derivación de Taylor. Y Benassi también, he preferido papers that they have done that, but we don't have in a fully fledged DSG model properly the Taylor rule to be derived, particularly if you have idiosyncratic shocks and incomplete markets. And work needs to be done. Now, with respect to the isomorphism of the money, the utility function over uh, drinks, you can spend time, this isomorphism only goes through if you have one well, I, I mean, that's the problem. Now, the real question is the last one, which is also kind of a fair question, but a tough question. The answer was given by Goodhart, and I've written a paper in order to, uh, to answer this question. The question, in fact, if you have investors to have continuous default, not to pay one payment, not to pay all of your contractual obligations, your credit cards, that makes sense. The problem is different. The problem gets really tough when it comes to banks. What does it mean, banks, to have continuous default on deposits? If you, if you default one cent in any deposit account, the bank is out of business. Now, the isomorphism that we have managed to establish is that the continuous default is isomorphic to endogenous probabilities of default. So basically, you can rehash the whole model whereby the continuous default rates, the payment rates on deposits are endogenous credit rates, endogenous probabilities of default. So, and that is the answer I like. Because the easy answer is, okay, don't worry, I will have collateral default only. Which is an easy answer. But that's an absolutely fair question. And it's a question that I had not thought of it till I started working in these things. And the answer to some extent was given by Charles, not by me. You have to give credit where it is due. The issue is sort of why there are these extraordinary occasional asset market uh, bubbles. Because you know, the, the sort of loan system is going to be very resilient to uh, you know, the valuation of the whole housing stock is suddenly reduced by three quarters or something. It's very difficult to see how the system can survive. And I can see, I, mean, I fully understand that it makes it worse mm -hmm. if, there's a, if everybody held, uh, you know, if all housing was financed through equity in some way, uh, the mm -hmm. system would cope better. But uh, would it, you know, isn't, isn't, it, isn't uh, you know, <laughs> I just don't know to what extent the problem was that because so much of the housing boom is financed, the subprime boom in America is financed through, through uh, bank loans rather than through equity, that, uh, you know, that made all the difference. The question basically revolves around the issue of the importance of the real estate market with respect to crisis, and this uh, asset price, housing price uh, appreciation that basically stand amount to a bubble and then by over leveraging then you have eventually the crash. And this, I may add, this is a, regular, a regularity that we see in most crises. The answer to this, first is correct. I totally agree and reinforce that behind any crisis there is a real estate appreciation. With respect to the recent crisis and in fact even the 1992 crisis, because the same identical crisis that happened in 2008, happened in 1992. And in fact, if you recall, it was a mortgage-backed security crisis that uh, rendered Kidder P body to Kidder no body, and one of the best uh, hedge, uh, hedge fund managers being a colleague of mine at Columbia, Mr. Askin. Now, I think this two things they have to do, they are associated with lax regulation. Because I think in practice, when you have a housing boom and the economy is in uh, expansion, it's very difficult to introduce regulation. And we saw that with Basel uh, II. Everybody was talking about the procyclicality, uh, dangers that uh, the Basel II had and the rest of it. Nobody was willing to put his finger on the problem and regulate banks till after the crisis. Now, the thing that I don't have an answer, and I don't want to have an answer, this issue of bubbles. I don't know what a bubble is. I don't know what a bubble is. Uh, moral hazard problem, problem in any way. All the participants, borrowers, lenders, banks, regulators. So are you incorporating the models? Yes. Okay. Now, this is 
since I started this talk by talking to Sudipto, let me conclude by talking again about Sudipto. That was exactly the point of Sudipto. The biggest challenge that now general equilibrium theory has, or equivalently contract theory has, is to match the two, the two ways of thinking. Now, so far, and to intermarry contract theory with general equilibrium theory. In this argument, I don't have individual moral hazard, but I have aggregate moral hazard. Because from a bank's point of view, I have many borrowers. So I made an expectation as to the repayment rate, because I don't know who is going to default on the loans I will extend. Therefore, I aggregate the loans and I prorate the repayment rate. And then, if there is default, then uh, payment and liquidation happens on a pro rata basis. So, in other words, aggregate moral hazard is present in the model. And in fact, that's why it's also analytically tractable. Now, moral hazard, the standard way that we know between lender and borrower, credit devaluation, and the rest of it, we don't have. The only thing we have done, and again in a paper with Sudipto, we had restricted participation, limited participation in these models in order to justify credit spreads and different interest rates across banks and across agents. We had a, an assumption that certain borrowers were associated with certain banks. And then we managed in our first paper with Sudipto uh, using a relative performance criterion of commercial banks that banks try to outperform their competitors to endogenously derive this uh, limited participation. And basically we used his arguments that he has used in uh, patents and uh, R&D literature and the rest of it. But properly there is a long way to go to properly introduce and incorporate moral hazard in these models. So you're saying that the mortgage contract is exogenous in your models. If you try to solve if you try to exogenize the mortgage contract in your model, you'll find such an optimal contract which will resolve the issues that you have? Good question. Uh, good question. On this, on this, okay, basically, let me escalate the level of the question. That when you do general equilibrium with incomplete asset markets, the asset matrix, the asset payoffs, in fact, again, that was exactly the question that I tried to answer to, <laughs> to John Moore and Ben Holmstrom back when I met Sudipto. They said, okay, in your model, the asset matrix is exogenous. Therefore, I don't like your model. Therefore, let me talk about, or I don't like your cash in advance, so let me talk about money without money. Let me talk about crisis in non-market models. Okay. The answer to this is that, I don't know which, I'll give you a political answer, and then I'll give you the real answer in my opinion, my humble opinion. First of all, I'd rather have exogenous contracts rather than talk about markets in non-market models. As simple as that. We have a crisis. The crisis, we talk about systemic risk. Systemic risk has heterogeneity. And we have models with no markets and no heterogeneity. And we talk about crisis. That's an intellectual oxymoron. And since we now we are in a new school, the high school of economics, well, these things, we have to be open about these things and honest about. This is bad economics. To talk about markets in non-market models. And about crisis and systemic risk, or lender of last resort activities with one bank. So that's the political answer. The real answer is that in this model, people have worked, in fact, they have offered a continuum of contracts, of mortgage contracts, and one of them is present in this room. Uh, actually, his paper was just published, that they have worked where you have a continuum of contracts available, and then in equilibrium, one of them is picked. Yet you don't recover the first best because you end up with a general equilibrium within complete markets. But there is work, work has been done on endogenizing a little bit the endogenous determination of the contract that will be traded in equilibrium. Yet more has to be done. More has to be done. And Rohit Rahit and JPZ Grant have done some work on that and the like. So there is work towards this direction. So uh, recently, Europe introduced uh, the centralization of the banking system. 
Uh, and you also mentioned that uh, we need to be regulating markets as opposed to individual banks. So does, do you think, firstly, this is a backward way of regulating markets by having a central regulate, regulatory system? And does, secondly, does this affect what the optimal combination of regulation is, the fact that you centralize it? Or is it better to regulate individually in each That's country? a seemingly soft question. Yudara asked the following thing. He said, recently uh, the European Union starts introducing the banking union, which behind the banking union is a centralization of regulation. And then he says, no, given that we centralize regulation, will that facilitate your machine to find the optimal combination of regulations that may be welfare improving? Or it will make it more difficult? Now, it's not soft at all. Uh, now, with respect to the banking union, from an economics, from a political point of view, I won't talk about that because there are political frictions as well. From an economic point of view, it seems central regulation, I have not proved it, but I, it's not even my conjecture, my guess is that centralized regulation kills regulatory arbitrage. Now, that's one thing. That's the good news. The bad news is that centralized regulation, I think, I go back to the point, it increases incompleteness because it kills spanning opportunities. Therefore, it has exactly the opposite effect. So perhaps the truth is somewhere in the middle. So, I, so to make the long story short, I don't know. Let's write a paper. <laughs> so if there are no more questions, then let's leave it with these final words, right? <laughs> let's write the paper. <laughs>